All right, thank you so much. All right, so as she said, I'm John Arrigo. I'm talking today about improving the sterility assurance application to the FDA. So the way I have this set up, let's give you a little background. I've asked managers, reviewers, a bunch of people in microbiology for the last 10 plus years what they see as the most common problems in applications. Then we all discussed and we thought, okay, these are, these are the big things, I'm gonna talk about them. We're gonna keep trying to hammer this home so we can improve the submissions. So the first thing, it might seem obvious, but I think this is worth it. Make it easy to read. So, quick story, I like to ramble. When I left grad school, I ended up in a patent law firm. And one of the senior attorneys said to me, when you're trying to make a point, say what you wanna say in the beginning, say it again in the middle, and then say it again at the end. Now that doesn't exactly apply here, but it's something I've never forgotten. And if you use a little bit of that tip, you're going to get the you're going to get your point across because remember a reviewer is sitting there and they're overwhelmed with all of this information so make it very clear so let me talk about this auto, like an autoclave an autoclave qualification for example look at the sentence i have written here autoclave x was qualified by performing three empty chamber heat distribution runs three worst case heat penetration biological indicator runs in 2016 the worst case load covers all loads proposed for production results are provided on page 18. Sometimes we just see results, and there might be hundreds of pages of results. But look at what that sentence does. It tells you what autoclave you're talking about, what types of runs were performed. It tells the date. Now this slide's a little old, so 2016's not the greatest, but you get the point. It talks about what types of loads, worst case, what it covers, and it tells you where to look for the load, the, the actual results. You can also provide summaries of the results. Tell us what the minimum and maximum temperatures are, the minimum and maximum of zero and the BI results. You can say that the summary is on page 15, the actual results are on page 18. That really can move the reviewer along. And give the simple things. Which machine are you talking about? What autoclave, what is the name? What is the filling line name? Are there multiple names that you use for this line in your, in your facility? What room numbers when you're talking about it? For example, don't assume that we know there's only one filling line in a building. That might be common sense to you because you know, well, this is the building we work in. There's only one filling line here. But we might not see that right away. So by calling it, oh, the filling line has been qualified, we might think which one because we're used to seeing facilities that have multiple filling lines. Certainly English translations are critical. And all of this is to move the reviewer along for a faster and more efficient review. So as I said, I'm jumping, I'm going to jump topics quite a bit here. So now sterilizing filtration. We see quite, quite an increase in the use of pre-sterilized, commercially available filling and filtration trains. That includes pre-packaged, pre-sterilized filters, tubings, uh, tubing large flexible bags, et cetera. So this is, this is all great, but just clearly mention the use of this in an application, right? Where is it being sterilized? Are, are you purchasing it sterilized? Are you, is it, if you're purchasing it that way, are you relying on a DMF to provide the sterilizing data? If you're sterilizing it yourself, tell us that. And I'll talk a little bit about DMFs later. But the idea is here is it, it just doesn't hurt to tell us too much information about what you're, what you're expecting us to quickly understand. We might not pick this up. This is trying to avoid deficiencies, right? So if, if you're buying the filter sterilized, we might, you might know that it's in an autoclave load. But we didn't know it's in the autoclave load, so we're trying to find a DMF because you've sterilized it as well and you've put it in the autoclave load. If you put it in there and we've already looked at the autoclave load, then the problem is solved. We might not know if your worst case load covers everything. So tell us exactly what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. We also see reuse of sterilizing grade filters during production campaigns. We recommend you avoid doing this, but we understand that you can. So when it's possible, uh, when you're trying to do this, just tell us the maximum number of times you're trying to reuse it or re-sterilize it because that way we're going to need to see the data to support that. We don't want to review some data and then find out down the road that, oh wait, they're planning on reusing this five times? That means that we have to go take a look at this data again and like for the bacterial retention studies, did it cover five uses? That's the kind of questions we're gonna be asking. So we wanna see that the data utilizes a worst case scenario for the amount of times you're reusing, reusing it. All right, so drug, drug master files. I think we all probably know what this is, but they allow confidential information to be referenced from another party. However, when it's not appropriately referenced, 
DMFs tend to cause a lot of confusion, and they can decrease review and application approval efficiency. So I've used this picture down here for, for quite a while. But this was back in the day when there were large volumes that the reviewers had to literally walk across the street to a document room, check out five or six or 10 volumes, put it in a cart, and push it through a parking lot back to your office. Now everything's electronic, but I'm still scarred from those, from those days. So that's why I want this thing here so we never forget that. But the recommendation here is clearly tell us where the information is. These DMFs can be enormous. These companies are huge, and they have an enormous amount of data in them covering many types of products. If you're, if you're using it for a rubber stopper, they might have tons of rubber stoppers, different sizes, different, different chemistry of the stopper. And just saying, hey, go look at DMF1234 can be an hour or more to try to find what we're talking about or what you want us to go see. So if you're relying on a DMF, please ask the company where the exact data is for what you have purchased and what you want us to review. Because we, will, we have to issue deficiencies if, if we don't know where it is. We can't just dig through a DMF forever, because it just takes forever. And again, that's the theme here. We're trying to increase the reviewer's efficiency, which essentially speeds the approval process. All right, so most of this I've been talk I'm going to talk about sterile situations. But in this scenario, we've, we've, we've come up with this situation where the type of product is a non-sterile powder. And the non-sterile powder has package insert instructions to reconstitute in an aqueous solution, and then there's a hold time associated with it. So the two situations I'm going to talk about is a multi-dose scenario and a single-dose scenario. And the single-dose scenario has an excessive hold time. So again, we have a powder as the product, then the, the instructions say mix with, with an aqueous solution, and then you can hold it 30 days, seven days, whatever, whatever that may be. And our recommendation is this. For a multi-dose scenario, we want USP51, the antimicrobial effectiveness test. We want USP60, B. cepatia testing, at release, or a risk assessment. Right. So I think that's key there, or a risk assessment. If you don't want to do USP60 at release, we, we, that's OK. But then show us how you've controlled your water systems, how you've controlled your manufacturing environment for Bisapatia, that you're looking for it. Prove to us, explain to us that you've done an assessment of this, that your facility is, is free of this organism. And then you won't have to show it at release for every batch. We also want an assessment of preservative content at the end of the storage time. Because some of these, some of these products can be held for 45 days. So show us that the preservative is still there at 45 days. So now the single dose scenario. This is when the package insert has excessive times for a single dose product and it usually does not have a preserving agent in it. We're looking for a microbiological challenge study over the proposed, over the proposed storage time. So this is when you can put your microbiology hat on and design a study. What organisms do you want to use? You're spiking it with an appropriate amount and you're carrying it over the storage time and you're going to show us that no excessive growth has occurred. In addition to that, we also want USP60 for the Bisapatia at release, or you can do a risk assessment. That's the key here, because these are aqueous solutions, or they're being resuspended in aqueous solutions. We want to make sure that your manufacturing facility has controlled for Bisapatia. And we think this is providing an improved risk assessment for these types of products. All right, bulk bioburden sampling. So this is when you're sampling the bulk solution to see how clean your scenario is. Right? So sometimes we see situations where there's a 0.45 micron pre-filter. There might even be a 0.2 micron pre-filter. And then there's a sterilizing filter. Sometimes we see the sampling of the bulk solution taking place in between these filter setups. And that's really not acceptable, because these filters really they work well. So if you sample in between a 0.45 or a 0.2 micron filter, it's going to show no organisms. What we want is for you to understand that and do the testing prior to any filtration. So sampling after a filtration doesn't tell you how well controlled your solution is. It can give you a false impression. And certainly microbial metabolites can pass through the filters. Right? Endotoxins can come right through it. And it might, it, as it says, it's going to give you a false impression. You're going to think that you're controlling the solution, but it's just because you've sampled after a filter. So we'll issue deficiencies sort of asking, where are you sampling this? And if you're sampling it in between a filter, to change the sampling to prior to filters, filtration. All right, biological indicators. So these are going to be used for autoclave qualifications, right? These are the spore-forming organisms that you're trying to see. Does your high heat really kill these? And what this is focused on is the incubation time. And the idea is seven days 
or an incorrect 24-hour incubation. So sometimes we see 24 hours, 36 hours, but what we're looking for is seven days. This comes from USP 55, which, which suggests seven days after inoculation. The ISO document, commonly recognized to be seven days. So I'm providing this here just to show that seven days isn't something that we're just making up. This is the established seven days. But what happened here, and there's no one's at fault, CDRH is not at fault for doing this. This is just, this guidance has come about and people have misinterpreted it. So CDRH, CDRH issued a guidance for healthcare facilities, right? So it's for sterilization systems in healthcare facilities, hospitals, dentist office, things like that. And you can go read this at your leisure, but I'm trying to just point you to the, the, the yellow here. They're saying the incubation period for BIs can be reduced from the standard seven or more days, provided you have validation studies, right? Now, if you, the next, bullet down there says, if you have 97% of your BI positive control grow out. So they're, they're getting this, if you can, if you can recover 97% of your positive control at three days, then they're saying that's okay. So for the drug world, for the manufacturing facilities, we say that's not okay. And the reason is because of, of what I said, it's not a complete grow out, right? Is 97% of a positive control, is that acceptable for your facility, for your manufacturing facility? No, so please do seven days. All right, so Erica's gonna talk about endotoxins next, but one thing that I have in my slide here that we commonly see is just the idea of pooling of samples. All right, so USP 85 in the question and answer section of that, the addition to that document, says that you can pool three units. So rather than do one test, you can mix three units and then, excuse me, rather than do three tests, you can mix three units and test once. But what happens here, if you think about what you've just done, you've made a threefold dilution. So while you're doing your endotoxins math and you're calculating the maximum valid dilution, you need to adjust that. So you take your maximum valid dilution and divide it by three if you're pooling by three. Right? You don't have to pool. But what we notice is in the, in the instructions on how to perform the test, when we're seeing how that's written, it might say, oh, pool three vials. But then the MVD has no divided by three. And then the reviewer's thinking, well, wait, did they account for this? Are they aware that basically they're diluting an extra threefold? And this can directly interfere with the ability of the test with inhibition and enhancement and things like that. So please consider that pooling concept. And if you are doing it, please tell us and then adjust for it. I threw a bonus down here. So while you're looking at the package insert, think about the pediatric dose. A lot of times we see the pediatric dose being missed. Right? It's not all about the adults. There might be infants, there might be children that are being prescribed this medicine, and you need to adjust for that. There's usually different doses and things like that. So keep your eye out for that. All right, media fills. We want you to clearly indicate the maximum proposed time for production, the, the filling time for production. Right? So we'll see these beautiful media fill studies, and they might be for 18 hours, 20 hours, then there's no mention at all of how long you're proposing to fill for production. Well, if you're proposing, I don't know, 36 hours for production, well then, are your media fills really worth it, anything? Did, we, did you prove to us that you can fill for that much time? So clearly indicate what you're proposing for production, that way we can compare it. It seems quite straightforward, but I think there just can be a mix up into what you think you need to tell us. And if lyophilization is utilized, let us know exactly what lyophilizer was used in the media fill, right? This really goes for any piece of equipment that you're using. The media fill needs to, needs to include the exact equipment that you're proposing for commercial production. And this gets back to that early slide I had where just, I'm asking, just tell us over and over again what you're using. If you have four lyophilizers that you're proposing to use, then we wanna see those lyophilizers be incorporated in the media fill. Tell us the names of them. Tell us which filling line. Tell us again what filling line it is, just to make sure we know exactly which one you're trying to qualify. All right, so now I'm moving into supplement filing tips, and it's the same theme, right? Tell the FDA, tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us. If you're proposing a bunch of changes, just make that cover letter so crystal clear in what you're trying to do, right? Even if you have to bullet change number one, we have a new rubber stopper. Change number two, there's an increased filling duration. Change number three, there's a new autoclave load, right? Just make it so clear on the front. Don't assume that we have all the prior reviews and submissions easily accessible, right? As wonderful as technology is, we all know what Adobe can do when you're trying to open a PDF that might be 600 pages, right? It can be very painful. So if you just have this very clear in the front, 
you can tell us what we're looking for, and we don't have to go into the historical records of these docu of these reviews, which might be over 10 years old. We might not even be able to find them because they're in a different repository, something like that. So try to make it clear, right? We have a new rubber stopper. We're changing from this size stopper to this size stopper. Or it might be something simple. We're simply changing the composition of the stopper. There's no change to the size. Just things like that. Tell us there's no change for things really helps. If you're, if you're doing like a prior approval supplement, trying to get to CBE 30 or CBE 0, I think the best thing to do is just simply tell us, what are you basing it on, right? Tell us when and what was approved in the past. If it's not a confidential issue, and you can tell us, hey, and a number X, uh, 123 in, in January 2023 was just approved with this same filling line, I mean, that is a huge time save to the reviewer. And then make it logical, right? We propose CB30 because this filling line was previously approved on January 1st and nothing else is changing, right? I added the italics there because I think the reviewer would just love to see that phrase, nothing else is changing. Because it, it, it sounds crazy, but when you're sitting there reviewing it, it's so easy to think, are they changing this? Why, why did they give me this autoclave data here? It's supposed, to be, it's supposed to be something different, but there's all this data. Should I review this? Why do I have to review it? Maybe they're just giving me too much information. But if nothing else is changing, maybe you just gave that and we don't really need to see it. So therefore, the reviewer doesn't have to waste three hours. So think of it in terms of that. All right, time for the quiz. This is, this is intense. So if your manufacturing plan includes purchasing a pre-sterilized filter, but you also put that filter into the autoclave load, what do you do? Do you tell FDA you're also sterilizing it yourself and include the data? Do you tell FDA you're sterilizing it yourself and do not include the data? Or you don't even tell FDA anything about this? Any thoughts here? I know it's the afternoon. All right, hey, I'll give it to you. Tell us, tell us you bought it sterile, include the data, give us a summary, do everything you can to make this easy for us to review. If we don't have to dig into doing a DMF, we don't want to. It's much, we've already reviewed the autoclave, right? Remember that, we've already reviewed the autoclave data. If you've got the filter in a worst case load, we're done. If you don't tell us that, now we dig into a DMF and you're picturing me 10 years ago pushing the, the volumes across the parking lot. All right, for question two. You're sampling the bio burden of the bulk solution and you're sampling it in between two filters. Is this okay? No. No, there we go. Yeah, she's good over there. No. All right, so the next couple slides, I have just a bunch of references. Uh, you're welcome to, to look through those. There's my contact information. And up next, 